This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs. Hi, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. You can learn more at FilmmakerU.com or, of course, follow us on Twitter at Filmmaker underscore U. Every week, we interview a film professional to discuss their work. And this week, I'm joined by cinematographer uh, Mia Chofi Henry, whose work includes Invisible Beauty, Superior, and The Surrogate, just to name a few. Welcome to the show, Mia. Hey, thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Glad to be here. Now, I want to know... Uh, I'm I'm very interested in your career because you've you're very connected with education as well as doing your your cinematography work. So, a I want to know how you balance that because cinematography takes up a lot of time. <laughs> uh, but what is it that attracts you to education? Yeah, um, I I I started out um, my career uh, in in LA in undergrad. I I was an actor um, and that it didn't it it wasn't appealing to me the lifestyle of an actor um kind of going on auditions and and getting headshots and being rejected and all of that and um i really loved the study of acting so much and as i sort of found my way through production design then which i studied in undergrad and into film when i kind of finally um landed in front of some equipment and and fell in love with the the process of making uh, films, which were on film at the time, um, I I never kind of lost that component of the analytical side, which I think I really got from, from acting. And um, when I decided to go back to school to study film uh, for grad and get my MFA, I always had in the back of my head that, oh, this would be great because someday I'd love to teach. My, my dad is a DP and my mom is a teacher. So it seems like, you know, a great... A, <laughs> a great um, mix of the two things. And it was, I, I moved, after I finished my, my MFA at NYU, I moved to Italy and started a family and was flying just near constantly with my daughter back and forth between New York and London and LA and uh, San Francisco and, and Italy. And it was exhausting. And um, a former professor of mine had called me and said, hey, do you want to take a class for a semester? You know, we need somebody once a week for four months. And I said, oh, this will be great. I'll, I'll be in New York for a little while. I get to try out a little bit of teaching and um, I won't have to be flying with an infant all the time. And that one semester has turned into six years um, teaching at NYU and now as the head of cinematography, I've realized that there is so much I learn about my own process by teaching. You have to really be on your toes all the time because your students ask you questions. Everything from what light do I use to, um, you know, my philosophy on on cinematography and um, how to survive as a cinematographer and uh, in the world. So, I feel like I've. I've had to really uh, be very introspective all the time and really think about, well, why do I choose this light first? Or why do I choose that light first? Or why why do I choose the lens that I choose? Um, and it's really been this, this amazing way to kind of crystallize my own education really early on, um, as well as uh, figure out kind of the system of my process and, and that ever evolving. I think the other thing is that I, I came up in a time where um, there weren't that many women cinematographers very visible. Um, of course, there have always been women behind the camera since since the beginning of um, filmmaking, but uh, they just weren't getting the spotlight the way that they are now, and people weren't actively searching for women or Black folks behind the camera. And so I realized when I very first started teaching how I had this um, this really great uh, opportunity to show folks coming up what what a young working cinematographer can really look like and and can accomplish um you know early on in their career because that was the first thing I said when they asked me to go full-time was like well I haven't done anything I'm not ready for that and they're like well we're not worried about that you're gonna figure it out um and so it's it's really true I feel like my students gravitate towards me not just the female students um but but everybody because I I um kind of have this finger on the pulse of what's happening 
current and right now. And I really love being that resource. And, and so much of filmmaking is passed down by word of mouth or, you know, there's only so much you can read in a book or watch on YouTube before you have to get your hands on things or you have to ask very specific questions about what you're trying to explore to, to people who are experts. Um, so, so mentorship and education are, I think, very tied into what we do. Um, I have always thought I, I will not be a cinematographer anymore when I stop facing new challenges, um, either through material or through the equipment or, or the technical uh, piece of it. I think we have to learn on every single project that we're doing. There's research, there's um, you know testing and experimentation, and, and we bring that into the next thing and the next thing. So as, as DPs, we're constantly educating ourselves and um, it's really great to just be be a resource to lots of people and and something that I didn't have coming up, which is uh, a mentor. Uh, so I, I I teach at NYU. I'm the head of cinematography in the graduate program there. And um, how do I make it work? <laughs> <laughs> we have we have a pretty flexible schedule because all of our student productions are in the middle of the semester. Okay. So I usually teach for six weeks and then I shoot, they go out and shoot for six weeks and then they come back for four weeks and then they're gone for two months and then they do it again with three months in the summer. So um, I have, I have quite a lot of downtime throughout the year, which is really awesome. And um, NYU keeps me in one place. And obviously with a young kid, it's very helpful because now she's in school full time and, you know, I can't just pull her out of school and and take her to Austria to while I'm shooting something on a mountaintop. So it's good to have kind of a home base here. Um, and, and then I just, I, everything else just kind of works within the schedule. Honestly, I don't have to take the jobs that I don't want just to pay my rent. <laughs> I think that's the biggest piece. I've been a camera person for 30 years and I fell in love with cinema. I heard there was free film school in France and I wanted to get into the French film school. I really didn't know anything at the time, but I knew at least how to take pictures. So I said, I'll try for the image department. And then when I miraculously <laughs> got into the French film school, I fell in love with working with the camera. You're following what's going to be in the movie. So that immediacy that the camera allows is what I loved from the beginning. I'm Kirsten Johnson, and this is my course about documentary cinematography. I think about, because I've done some teaching for post-production, and the thing that always blows me away is the questions the students will come to you yeah. after the class not during the class it's always after mm -hmm. the class and I've always I've said this to companies I'm like you need to somehow be have like a fly on the wall in the class because the questions the students ask will be like I've never it, like I've had students somehow get codecs into the software when the systems wouldn't accept the codex <laughs> and I'm like how did you do that and then the yeah. system crashes or yeah um and you're just like I don't know it's the things they come up with um, yeah, the problems are just films. as innovative as the solutions must always be. Yeah, right? yeah. So now you said um, you're always learning and things, and you worked on uh, Invisible Beauty with uh, with Beth Ann, uh, who's like an icon. Totally. So what did you learn? A, what did you learn from as a cinematographer? But what did you learn from her? Because she's done so much in her life. Yeah, uh, it's funny. I I don't typically shoot documentary. Um, that hasn't been um, kind of my experience. I know a lot of folks come up through documentary and they have, it's like, it becomes a way that they, they see into things. For me, I think, because I always started through narrative route, first as an actor and, and then as a de designer and then into cinematography, I feel like I've always been about um, using the medium for what it's special for, which is is taking a three dimensional space and turning it into a two dimensional um, kind of visual representation of an emotion. And so I, my in my very first phone call with Beth Ann and and her co director Fred, I said, well, you know. I don't really do documentary. Like, why, why would you want me to shoot this? You could kind of get anybody. And they said, well, we're really looking for somebody who's thinking about story and cinematography. And I think it was, um, it ended up being such a great match because I fell in love with Beth Ann and, and our paths had kind of crossed in a couple of really crazy ways um, over the years, over our lives um, without knowing it. And so it felt like um, really, you know, 
fate, for lack of a better word, that that we would find each other and and um, kind of be able to tell this story together. I think on a personal level, she was always a black woman in a world that didn't understand her, and she never let that stop her to do anything, um, either it be a model or uh, working in the garment industry, um, kind of uh, behind behind the public view, you know, uh, working with designers um, or working uh, as an agency, uh, starting an agency and working as a talent agent and um, all of her other amazing little uh, tangents throughout her life. So I kind of fell in love with her and, and what she was always up against. And it felt very similar to my the themes of my own life. Um, so I, I said yes. And I had to learn a lot about um, about shooting documentary in a quick a quick amount of time. Um, I think it it in a lot of ways it it does not play to my strengths because I like to plan things and I like to be uh, really sure of a location that I'm going into and what's my plan going to be and how am I going to use it to the best of its ability to tell our story. And a lot of times I had to walk into a location for an interview and I had never seen it before and sort of dress it and you know we're a small crew we just I think we had two two maybe three lights maximum um you know what where are we gonna how am I gonna make this interesting um but I loved that challenge and I think it it calls back to simpler moments in my career when I had to make a lot out of a little uh and I really lent like was leaning myself into that um and then we had we did have times where we got to kind of create um, what we were, what we began to call the present tense of the film, which, you know, we, we talk a lot about her past, there's archival footage, there's lots of interviews and uh, footage from her and photographs from her as, as a child and, and a young adult. Um, and we really needed to ground the film in order to tell the story and kind of keep it in a container. And so we found the language of the present tense really through um, experimentation of just being in her space and, and filming things very um, intentionally and lighting very naturally and um, just kind of having this calm because she is such a dynamic character uh, who is always moving, always talking, <laughs> always on the go, always five steps ahead of, of whatever we're doing. Uh, so it was, it was a fun challenge. It was really a lot of fun. Now I have a weird question. Yeah. Because... Whenever I've been on set, it's all about like comfort so that you can, you know, what you're wearing has to be comfortable. You know, for example, a lot of people might wear cargo so they can put pens and stuff and keep it with them. But she is like on point <laughs> whenever she's like on camera, she's like yeah. dressed to the nines. She's got a yeah. very specific style. So I feel like if I was on set, I would have been like, oh, I'm in shorts and a t-shirt so I can get around <laughs> was that like something you thought about or were you like ah she she understands I'll be a it's, cinematographer you know it's very funny because I feel like when I was a camera assistant I was all about utility mm -hmm. and then as a cinematographer I'm somewhere between um utility and um I don't know, maintaining a sort of level of like, I'm, I'm here to work, but I'm also uh, not the worker, yeah. <laughs> which is weird to say. And it's, it's more for me to kind of like have my own uniform so that I don't like run over and start moving lights because I have that, that capacity. And it's like, I kind of stay in my lane. So I do often wear loafers on set, which is not something I would recommend. It's the hell on your feet, but um, it gives me a little bit of, it slows me down a little bit, which I like. Um, and, you know, you've got to, I, I think we all have a studio look or a fashion, fashion mm -hmm. shoot look, which is a little bit different from when we're shooting in the mountains and, and uh, you know, the woods. Um, so I, I, I try and tailor it to that. But I just, I just uh, was having lunch with the director, Casey Lemons, uh, this week. And it's so funny because I asked her if she had a directing uniform. And she said, oh, absolutely. And we were both <laughs> laughing at, at our affinity for hats. Um, oh, yeah. We always have to have hats on set. And um, I always wear a hat. In fact, I, I always wear a hat. And Beth Ann, every time I go to her apartment, she gives me a hat. <laughs> Amazing. So I have a whole collection of hats that she gave me. I'm sure I have some sitting next to me here um, because she's like, I don't wear hats. You're always in a hat. Here, take this. So some <laughs> of my favorite hats now are, are hats that she got somewhere or someone oh. gave her. Yeah, I have no idea how, like I look at the old photos of like film from like the forties and fifties and everyone's in like a suit or like, yeah. in a proper, I'm like, how do you do that? That looks so uncomfortable. But <laughs> now I, 
I sometimes, do wanna... I have to say this. Sometimes looking good is is part of it. Mm-hmm. I think um, especially when I'm when I'm walking onto a set that I feel nervous about and is a little bit bigger than I'm used to. I feel like if I'm if I'm dressed a certain way, if I feel confident in what I'm wearing, if I kind of the old adage like dress for the job you want sort of a thing. Um, I think it brings a little something when I feel put together, I feel like I can, I can do my job a little bit better than if I walk in just like disheveled. Um, so I, I, I do think what you wear on set is besides being utilitarian, which my, my whole thing is you change your shoes and socks at lunch, no matter what the job is. I always, always change my shoes and socks at lunch changes everything. Oh, wow. Now I do want to know about documentaries because like when I think about fiction and drama, it's very much, it's very, very structured. So it's like, here's the script. This is what we're going to copy. We're going to have a tone meeting at the beginning of the day to discuss how it's going to look and feel. But in documentary, like you said, you're walking into a space. So what is the discussion about tone for a documentary? Like, how do you guys figure that out? And then on the day, make sure that you're sort of meeting that requirement. Yeah, I think for me and Fred, who I did all of the interviews with, uh, Fred Chang, the co-director, um, it was really about setting up at the very beginning what we felt like the look of the film was going to be at its various different points, the archival, the interviews, the uh, verite, and then the kind of present tense, which was a little bit more staged, um, sort of discussing what those each of those things had in common or had differently, which was a conversation we had both in pre-production and production, and then also again in post with our colorist. Um, And that it was really important, I think, that we kind of understood how that was going to all get weaved together eventually. Uh, So when we kind of set our looks, we we really gave ourselves, and because I wasn't doing all of the interviews, we had some interviews in uh, Miami and on the West Coast that I couldn't travel for. Um, so I needed to be able to communicate to the the DPs on um, on those shoots. You know, this is my depth of field. This is my this is my lens choice. This is how I'm framing. This is how I'm lighting. Um, and so I created a look sheet for that very early on, and that was then our guide both for, for myself and for the other um, additional DPs to kind of maintain a balance across everything. And then when we would go, when we would show up for an interview or um, kind of a verite day, we would we would reverse engineer it. We knew what we were getting out of the interview because Fred would have already done a pre-interview with the person. Um, so we knew kind of where in her life um, the material would fit, where in the film roughly it was going to fit uh, based on um, kind of, you know, oh, this person really came along during Black Girls Coalition and was a big supporter. And so there's going to be a lot of um, archival footage surrounding that that's going to be black and white, that is going to be about um, sort of this this key component of activism. So um, how do we want to light this so that it complements that or fits in into that part of it? Or um, this interview is about her childhood and it's we want it to be in more of a domestic setting and we want to make sure it feels um, a little bit different from the business side of things because this is you know her childhood um, friend and and father of her of her son. So we want to make sure it kind of works in that world. So we we were really putting everything in containers um, from the beginning emotionally, and then when we get there, no matter what it looks like, we kind of just uh, try to work towards that as best we can. But sometimes you're staring at a white wall in the middle of Midtown, and <laughs> you just hope that the material plays in the in the close up as much as possible. <laughs> now, you in your uh, bio, you've mentioned that you're you're inspired by William Eagleston. Now, I, I'd like to know, like, what is it about his work that inspires you? And, and you know, how do you take that into your your work on dramas? Yeah. I think I first saw, saw one of his photographs. I think the first photograph I saw was um, the tricycle shot. Um, I must have been 15, 14 uh, when I saw that. I might have been at MoMA. And um, I, I was immediately drawn to the sort of candid setting, um, but really graphic and sty- almost stylized sort of version of reality. Uh, and the more I found out about his process and and um, it's almost sketching in nature because he takes just thousands of photos at a time and then curates it as mm-hmm. opposed to setting up the perfect shot 
Um, I, I I just I loved that sort of juxtaposition of of the form and and the um, and the process. Uh, but I I love there's there's something very cinematic about his his frames, um, the color, the texture, the sort of graphicness of it that I feel like I just really. Uh, gravitate towards. I think another one of his images that I'm I'm in love with is um, the tray table and on on an airplane with the glass and the sunlight is coming through it uh, because those are the kinds of things that are natural. They're found, but when I see that in my world, I'm I'm sitting with you know a cup of iced coffee and the light suddenly shines through it. I'm in, incredibly enamored by the shape and the texture and the color and and the vibrancy of that. And so I think I. I think we see things in where we're attracted to similar images uh, in in found reality. Um, so just a little bit more cinematic than, yeah. you know, if you're paying attention, if you're observant, um, you you will appreciate those, too. I think that's that's sort of the lesson I get from a photographer like him, uh, who's essentially a street photographer. Uh, but his 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 images are um, they you could try to stage them. But but you wouldn't be able to find the same magic, um, and it's interesting because another another photographer I've always been interested in in is uh, Gregory Crudson, and his images are the exact opposite. They're large format. They they are basically like film sets to create. They're so um, they're so staged. They're so specific. They're down to the the tiniest little prop and and um, and gesture and facial expression. But they also capture this sort of heightened version of reality that I think is um, is very intriguing. But they're I think the way that they're made is just polar opposites. Well, and I was going to say like he's a street photographer. Is that like um, is that like the style that you you gravitate towards, or is it just the, in this case would, this particular? I wouldn't say so. I think my my style is somewhere more towards kind of the staginess mm -hmm. in a way. I love um, one of the reasons I love working on film is because of how um, how careful you you can be uh, with lighting. Not to say you can't do that on digital, but there is. I, I feel a certain power as a cinematographer that I get to maintain on set when saying like, no, 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 like we can't go, the light is not ready. And, you know, I will often chalk it up to, we don't have the exposure yet, but we probably could shoot. <laughs> it just, it just, I want it a certain way. And when you work on film and everybody's not hovered around the monitor, uh, they trust mm -hmm. you in saying it's not time to go or yes, we can, we can shoot. Uh, when you're working on digital, people are like, it's good enough. Let's keep moving. We don't have time to light. Um, so I, I do like being um, specific in my lighting when when the story calls for it um, and, and really intentional in the frames. But I don't always get that chance for sure. Yeah, so here's an I, this just popped into my head. So I don't even know if there's an answer to this, but like you like being really specific. But then at the same time, like film has a different power uh, from digital because you're getting to look through the lens and not other people. Yeah. It, as things like uh, virtual production is becoming more and more uh, popular, or I guess popular to use, but it's still expensive, but it is coming down in price. How do you think that's going to impact your, uh, how you work? Because essentially like you can be really specific with the VFX team and be like, I want the whole world to shift. Yeah. But then everyone is watching and sort of seeing everything. And you have so many more cooks in, in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Well. You have so like 30 VFX. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who are, everybody has a different, a different thing that they're tracking for themselves. I think um, I have not done a ton of um, virtual production work, but I have um, been in many conversations about it and and at NYU we're opening a, a school in virtual production. So it's been a really interesting learning process to kind of get to know all of the tools and processes. Um, what I love about it is that there's like no such thing as an expert still. Yes. And so there's yeah. no there's no standard way of doing anything. So you get to still kind of write your rules. Um, I think because of all of that, there's also built in pre-production time. Uh, whereas, you know, people used to say, oh, well, we'll you know, we're going to comp that in. We'll find that image later because we can just shoot it green screen now. Uh, and it was a little bit of a a, a, um, a putting off of, of the 
figuring out the full image. Yeah. Um, now that it's that work has to flip to before production happens, I, I'm hoping that the conversations around um, you know, what ends up on on the on the screen and and how to do that because of all of the technical components involved in getting the parallax and your pixel pitch and your da da da, da all of those things. Um I'm I'm hoping that that leads to more creative discussions earlier on and more room for those creative discussions um, because that those are the things that matter the most because uh, whether you're working in a very stylized or or um, specific way or you're working documentary um, and kind of more or run and gun or independent whatever you can accomplish whatever you need to accomplish as long as you've had those pre-production conversations about what you want the final product to be. Um, I think that across the board, the conversations in pre-production um, are the most important part and process of making a film because that's how you're gonna then view the work uh, when you're on set is based on those conversations. So I'm hoping that virtual production just leaves more room for that earlier on in the process and that people will take it a bit more um, to heart. Uh, you know, everybody wants a shot list, but uh, they don't want to leave the space to create uh, the rules before mm -hmm. you make the shot list. And those are the things that help you when you're stuck uh, on set and it's two o'clock in the morning and the scene's not working and you can't figure out why. It's like you go back to before we had this shot designed, well, what did we want out of this scene? What was the purpose? Why was the scene even in the script in the first place? Um, and you kind of tap back into uh, that discussion. You say, oh, oh, this scene was about, you know, um, the son coming home to to the grieving mother and it's uh, unexpected and it's about redemption in their relationship. OK, cool. Got it. So you know that's that shorthand you tap back into how we're shooting it is not working with that in mind given you know what the situation is let's put the camera over here on a 40 and just stay there or whatever it is mm -hmm. to kind of solve the problem but if you haven't had that discussion about what the scene is really about the subtext how it fits into the bigger picture it's really hard to um i find it's really hard to shift gears and maintain that same um sense of of the themes or whatever it is you're trying to tell in the story. I yeah. think that, and that's what people mean when they say story first. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. it's really easy to sort of say, oh, as long as it serves the story. And a lot of young filmmakers don't really understand what that means. Or they think it means making sure that the dialogue comes across or, um, you know, that the, the beats of the scene, the plot are there, but that's actually not what it means to me at least it means what what you're what you're trying to say what what the intention is what you want the audience to understand from the story that's that's story coming first now i love that it's the wild west because like everyone's just sort of figuring it out and like i i was on one set and they sh they had figured out how to do slow motion with it in the background amazing and then i was on another set and i was like oh yeah over there they did slow motion and like five people were like how did they do it what, what was the <laughs> thing and i was like oh i don't know i don't know anything about this <laughs> that's not my knowledge that you'll have i just to know what happened yeah i was yeah. just i was at car stage last week i brought my students there uh to car stage in queens and um we were talking about that exact thing because of course a student said like well can you do slow motion and they it was a whole conversation about frame rates and we can do we can do 50 but we can't do 48 we can do 60 but we can't do 30 you know all of this stuff and we were just all like oh my gosh okay there's so much math involved yeah. in all of this and um you know that all might change because now there's a new system coming in or yeah. now there's a new engine you know it's like things only last for a half a second well, um, that, yeah, that was the thing. They called the guy, and he was, and he just gave them the math equation. <laughs> yeah, they're like, great, yeah, yeah. To figure this out. We so. just get it back to that. And I think there's also something about getting these tools in the hands of independent filmmakers, of of people who aren't uh, restricted by studio days and and union hours and all of this stuff to to experiment. I think that's how we're going to learn a lot. Really, is yeah. um, kind of pushing pushing the medium forward with people who are used to being really scrappy, who are used to figuring it out on the go and, and really used to problem solving in the moment. And that's like, I think that's gonna take on this whole new wave of, of innovation in a way that like DSLRs did 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of show like 
oh, okay, this is actually a completely different way of looking at this visually and uh, technically as well. So I'm I'm excited about that when when it stops just being a medium for big studio shows and um, and starts getting in the hands of independent filmmakers. I think mm -hmm. it's going to open up a whole new world for sure. Now I have one last question for you. What would you say is your favorite guilty pleasure film or TV show to watch? Um, I I would. I have two. I have two in very different directions, I would say. If I'm watching films and it's guilty pleasure and it's about comfort, it's old Hollywood, old yeah. Hollywood musicals for sure. Um, last weekend, I watched Easter Parade with my family. I got to yeah. play that with my daughter for the first time. And it's it's um, it's you just are awash in colors and costumes and musical numbers and big um, cinematic. I don't know what. uh spectacular i yeah. love that i feel like it's it's candy um and then if it's television um i'm, I'm gonna go with survivor <laughs> oh, awesome. for the exact opposite reason uh because yeah. it's not it's not about flash it's not about cinematic storytelling or they'll, they'll they'll give you a beautiful shot of a snake in the grass right to to, yeah. to punctuate a an interview but it's really about characters and and plot and plotting and and moving story along very quickly uh in an edit and so it's uh, I like watching it because I I don't have my my DP cap on so much. I'm just like enjoying the ride of uh, what Survivor is. <laughs> now I thought you were going to talk about uh, Douglas Sirk and his melodramas uh, yes, based on your that, bio. That too. <laughs> Although Douglas Douglas Sirk is definitely not a guilty pleasure. Yeah. But I think um, you know in in going back to kind of my influences of of photographers, I feel like uh, Douglas Sirk. Is, is just there there's never going to be anybody quite like him in how seriously he took something that people did not consider serious yeah uh, which was the melodrama genre and how he was able to by I mean he honestly was making films in Germany and then he'd come and make the exact same film in the U.S. Uh, in English and I think by doing that he learned so much um, and it's he didn't he never got bored he did that with script after script uh recreating his his german films for american audiences uh and and each time he got deeper and more um emotional with the lighting with the framing with the with the images that were on screen and i think um i'm 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 always so curious uh, with with things that are made primarily for female audiences and what that says and what we can learn from that. And um, I, I, I feel like his his melodramas are interesting character wise, lighting wise, camera wise and, and story wise as well. Um, I'm I'm prepping a project right now that takes place in the soap opera world. And oh, it's yeah. so interesting to kind of be diving into that as a medium um, speaking of things made primarily for female audiences these days, um, it's it's very I'm I'm very much looking forward to getting to play with the the tools and tricks of of soap opera uh, as well as fantasy in that. Amazing. Well, thank yeah. you so much for letting me interview you today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. And that's it for this week, everyone. Make sure to check us out at filmmakeru.com or, of course, on Twitter at filmmaker underscore you. I'm Gordon Burkell. Thanks for watching. This video is made possible by our sponsors, AJA. We'd like to thank AJA for all their support and tell you to go to AJA.com for all your production and post-production needs.